work for people and for nature if we're going to achieve the sustainable development goals but also the actual targets and later the global framework uh, for biodiversity on 2020. So I'm really looking forward to listening to this and great to see that aquaculture is on the agenda. Um, also, as you know, that IUCN released um, a global standard on nature-based solutions last year and aquaculture would fit into both that and to sustainable blue economy. Uh, it's really about, the standard is really looking about harnessing and tackling the environmental and societal challenges. And we will hear some remarks later on. So I look forward to listening to you and I hope you enjoy the session. And finally, I would like to thank not only my colleagues for organizing this, but to AFD for the generous support. Uh, this is part of the, the, the French uh, partnership, the French IUCN partnership that goes very, very long way back. So I'm grateful for this collaboration. And um, with that, thank you very much. And I'll hand the microphone back to Francois. Thank you very much and en enjoy this session. Thank you very much, Mina. Excellent. So, yes, uh, as Mina said, aquaculture is uh, an important topic. And uh, when I was working with IUCN and, and even now, I'm, I'm trying to put that on the agenda. And uh, we created with Rafaela uh, a, a group of specialists within the Commission on Ecosystem, which is called Ecosystem Based Aquaculture Group. And we are trying to uh, work on uh, dif different points uh, related to how aquaculture can be really uh, ecosystem based. Uh, so we, we, do, we are doing different things, uh, but this is a, today's presentation of a, a project called AquaCoco, which means aquaculture, coastal communities and coastal conservation, because uh, uh, our idea is to link uh, aquaculture, sustainable, sustainable aquaculture, and uh, the uh, coastal community and marine conservation, or coastal conservation, or even water conservation. Uh, so we, are we have been trying to, uh, first, as Mina said, uh, the power of, of cases, of concrete cases, to gather. Uh, our first idea is to gather a number of cases that uh, are demonstrating uh, uh, that aquaculture and marine conservation can be developed together. That's not, not uh, something that are separated. And uh, for that, uh, we have been conducted four, four cases. Uh, that we will explain today. Uh, first is in Zanzibar, it's about seaweed. Second is in uh, Tunisia, but uh, sea bream and, uh, in cage. Uh, fourth in Indonesia uh, on, on uh, mangrove aquaculture. And the fourth one in Polynesia about uh, clam, giant clam aquaculture. So very diverse, very diverse uh, objectives, very diverse uh, difficulties, very diverse challenges also. And, um, and all, all, all of this together, it's also to, demonst to demonstrate and to show how aquaculture and nature-based solutions are linked. So Rafaela is working precisely on this, and we'll have uh, some, some also explanation about uh, the link between nature-based solutions and aquaculture. And finally, AD from Australia will tell us about uh, uh, restorative aquaculture, how also uh, really aquaculture can be a tool for restoration of ecosystems. So we'll go through this, uh, this uh, journey on, on different, uh, with looking at different uh, colleagues online. So the, the first uh, is uh, our, our our colleague uh, Aboud is uh, the uh, principal secretary of the Minister of Blue Economy and Fisheries in Zanzibar. And uh, he sent us uh, uh, a video, so we'll look at a mm, video. But he, he's maybe online, I don't know. He, suppo he was supposed to be online, and maybe he will uh, uh, talk after, but during the, uh, the, uh, the hour we have. The structure of this uh, uh, event is we have uh, 30 minutes with presentations, very short presentation, and then we'll have 30 minutes hopefully left for discussion with you. So uh, if you have questions, we'll all together at the end. So let's, let's have the video first from, from Zanzibar. Hello. First, let me take this great opportunity to thank the organizers of this session for their sustained engagement and support in further strengthening coordination capacities and promote collaboration for the attainment of our blue economy, mariculture, and marine conservation initiatives in Zanzibar. I also wish to acknowledge the achievement of the Aqua Coco project in Zanzibar. Their support at that time in bringing together, engaging, and disseminating in areas of marine conservation areas and mariculture is making a huge difference in our dynamics. This shows that our partnerships are rapidly evolving for the better governance of our ocean. Our ocean is endowed with high value coastal and marine biodiversity hotspots. The coastal forests, wetlands, reserves and sanctuaries, rivers and deltas, mangroves and coral reefs all support the vital transboundary connectivity 
that binds all of us together. These ecosystems are fundamental and key to our blue economy, communities, livelihoods, equity, and resilience. This is the blue economy that we in Zanzibar seek to achieve. Also, the rates of pollution, degradation of biodiversity also increase. It is vital that we begin to address these emerging threats on our ocean ecosystems in a cross-sectoral and transboundary approach. Zanzibar's economy is entirely and directly connected to the coastal and marine ecosystems and services, and that the threats on these fragile habitats and climate change are rapidly undermining our resolve to tackle sustainable development challenges. Without addressing these challenges on fisheries, mariculture, seaweed farming and tourism, we will continue to dwell in environmental and climate insecurity. Therefore, we have taken drastic efforts here in Zanzibar to engage the Blue Economy Framework to implement the targets of the Sustainable Development Goal number 14. Our priorities on the conservation and protection of our ocean, which include climate adaptation, marine spatial planning, integrated coastal zone management, must equally benefit our communities and minimize environmental and social impacts. Our seaweed farming communities need a sustainable plan to access innovation, resources, awareness, tools, capital, and markets to transform their livelihoods. We must integrate our fisheries, mariculture, seaweed farming, tourism into sustainable, bankable, and blue economy projects. We must find ways to increase the economic benefits of our people through sustainable management of fisheries, agriculture, and tourism together. So we must increase scientific knowledge, develop research capacity, and improve ocean health to enhance our marine biodiversity initiatives. We need to exchange knowledge on mariculture and seaweed farming, and at the same time develop awareness in conserving our coastal and marine ecosystems. We need to invest more in protecting our coral reefs, mangroves, and other critical habitats, including fish spawning areas along our coast. Not only that, but we must also engage land-based issues such as waste management, marine litter, microplastics, and wastewater discharge. We need to develop partnerships to build on resilient climate change adaptation measures. Let me conclude by pledging that we will continue to work together with all our bilateral, regional, and global partners in all areas of cooperation to ensure the long-term goal of safe and sustainable blue economy for the sake of our communities. Thank you and wish you all the success in the session and in the Congress. Thanks, thanks a lot. Abud is not online, unfortunately, so we can't really uh, uh, thank him for that. I hope maybe it will be later on, but uh, we don't, we're not sure. Uh, so the second case is uh, uh, from Tunisia, I told you, about fish culture. And here we have <laughs> our Tunisian colleagues here. Uh, so uh, Association Notre Grand Bleu and uh, Ahmed, and also Ahmed, <laughs> two Ahmed <laughs> here for us. And uh, we'll have also Hussam, uh, who is online. Hussam is uh, also from Tunisia, but he's working for FAO, he's, uh, for, for the GFCM, for the General Fisheries Commission for the Mediterranean, so he's online. And so I give the mic to, um, to uh, Ahmed for some minutes of explanation. Bonjour you can share monde. the screen if you want, just to share the video uh, at uh, in the same time that uh, Ahmed is speaking, uh, uh, Francois. Okay. Euh, je m'excuse, je vais intervenir en français. En fait, euh, je présente l'association Notre Grand Bleu. C'est une association basée en Tunisie, créée en 2012. Elle s'occupe de l'autoral marin et surtout les îles Curiates, comme on voit dans la photo. La petite Curiate, c'est 70 hectares et la grande a 270 hectares. Elle est riche, il y en a plein de spécificités écologiques, surtout les tor tortues marines, puisqu'elle est le seul site d'une édification stable des tortues marines au moyen de 45 nids. Euh, comme vous voyez, on a le nombre de visiteurs, il est diminué à cause du Covid à 50%, mais quand même, il y en a un membre très important. C'est pour cela que l'association assure le suivi des tortues marines, assure le, les comptages et, et les capacités d'accueil des sites. Euh, aussi, euh, on fait le suivi des tortues marines, surtout la nuit, de 6 heures de l'après-midi jusqu'au matin. Et pour cela, on les marque 
euh, en train de nidifier. On a plus que 50% des tortues nidifiées sont mar marquées. Et pour cela, ça ouvre des hypothèses scientifiques puisqu'on a des tortues qui sont venues de l'Italie, des tortues qui sont venues d'autres sites, de Grèce et tout ça. Et c'est ça, en, 2019, euh, en 2020, on a plus que 2719 euh, tortues, euh, des bébés tortues qui sont regagnés à la mer. C'est pour cela, cette année, on prévoit un nombre plus élevé. Euh, il nous faut peut-être une présence journalière sur les sites. L'année dernière, on a contribué avec 51 bénévoles qui sont installés sur les sites. Et cette année, il y en a beaucoup plus. Euh, ce travail se fait avec euh, le CARASP, avec euh, l'Institut national de biotechnologie marine, euh, avec l'NSTM et aussi avec le conservatoire des littorales parce qu'on fait les co-gestions avec l'État. C'est une nouvelle expérience en Tunisie, co-gestion entre la PAL et l'association Notre Grand Bleu. Et pour le, les milieux marins, on fait le suivi des posidonies, ainsi que la, la cartographie, aussi le, les comptages de poissons et le balisage de herbiers de posidonie. On prend des mesures régulières comme un indicateur important dans les sites. Et après, on, on prend les mesures de euh, euh, limite inférieure des posidonies et les comptages de poissons des sites pour qu'on sache euh, la relation entre les surpêches et les ressources naturelles du site. Et c'est ça notre euh, travail. Pour cela, pour la sensibilisation, on, toujours on organise des campements pour les médias et des campements aussi pour le... Euh, de médias euh, pour les fils pêcheurs pour qu'ils puissent passer le, me le message à leurs parents. Et pour les supports éducatifs, on a créé un sentier sous-marin sur les îles Coréat pour accueillir les visiteurs, les, leur expliquer d'une façon innovante la richesse écologique pour qu'ils puissent peut-être la conserver et nous aider à le faire euh, comme vous voyez. Euh, pour qu'on a fait tous avec le projet de l'aquaculture, je vais passer la parole à euh, mon ami euh, Hossem qui va vous expliquer le travail fait sur la, les îles Curiat. Et merci. Thank you very much, dear, dear Ahmed, for, for the video. If you, if you can continue, I will share my screen if you want, just to continue with the video. Or if you can, François, uh, just okay. open the one you have. We can see you. It's fine, Sam. But uh, okay, okay. I will, I will share my screen if you allow me. Maybe. Okay, perfect. Sure. No, we have. Just a moment. We, we can let the video on if you prefer, Usam. Do you see my screen? Uh, not yet, but uh, it, will, it will come fully. Okay, now we see your screen. Okay, perfect. Yes. Uh, ah, yes, but. Uh, so we arrived here, I think. So thank you, Ahmed, for presenting the Kuriat Island. Uh, it's a really fantastic place in Tunisia. And there is a lot of activities, many activities, starting with fisheries and uh, uh, also aquaculture. And uh, the Monasir Bay is the first production area in Tunisia. Uh, for that, we, we, we want, and uh, the Tunisian authorities request the support of the GFCM in order to be sure that uh, we, we will develop the sector, but in a sustainable way. And for that, we, we start with a multi-stakeholder platform in which we have NGOs, we have fishermen, we have all the users uh, in Munasir Bay in order to start a discussion. But in, on the basis of scientific tool, what can aquaculture provide to the area? How we can ensure that aquaculture is not affecting uh, the, the, the area, uh, Kuriat Island? And I think we succeed with the MSP tools and with the uh, with uh, uh, the contribution of all the partners to identify the suitable site, to identify also the carrying capacity for each site. And uh, the results are there, processing uh, many data, thousands and thousands of data, identifying the carrying capacity, and also moving farm what is needed when it's requested. And we already changed the location of two farms because we, we, we uh, noticed that there is an impact on, on the area. So consultation is very important. Participatory approach was a strong tool that we applied. And I'm sure that uh, if we apply the same models in other areas, it could be really successful. 
Thank you, Francois. So it was quite brief. Thank you very much, Sam. Yes, it was quite brief, and uh, there is many things to, to, to say. Uh, hopefully, after the, uh, this uh, first half of the uh, session, we'll have time for question and answer. So please stay online, and I'll try to give you back the floor uh, after the presentations. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sam. And then we go now to the next uh, case in Indonesia. Uh, our colleague Ilman, I think, is uh, is online also, so yes. maybe he can. Uh, uh, we, sh we show the video. We show the video first, and maybe yes. Ilman will tell us uh, something. Good afternoon, everyone. Let's Thank have the video. you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Muhammad Ilman. I am the director of. So we have the we have the sound, but not yet the video. a bit complicated Good everyone. Hybrid. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Muhammad Ilman. I am the director of Indonesia Ocean Program, uh, Yayasan Conservasi Alam Santara, or also known as the Nature Conservancy Indonesia. I am here today uh, with my colleague Basir, who will introduce himself. Basir. Yes, thank you, Bang Ilman. My name is uh, Basir. I am the East Kalimantan Program Coordinator of Yayasan Conservasi Alam Santara. Good afternoon, everyone. It is nice to join the workshop today, although online. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Bang Ilman. Yeah, thank you, Basir. So today we will present our case study about the interaction between uh, the community's livelihood, which is aquaculture, and the Darawan Island Marine Protected Area. Uh, Basir will provide background information of the Marine Protected Area and also the characteristic of the livelihoods in this MPA. Over to you, Basir. Yes, thank you, Bang Ilman. Uh, as we know, the Rawan Islands MPA is located within the world's most important area for marine uh, biodiversity. It is well known as the uh, Coral Triangle uh, Region. They are also a very important source of uh, livelihood for the local community. Uh, aquaculture, for example, has been practiced since the early uh, 1980s to cultivate uh, shrimp and milkfish uh, in brackish water, but uh, unfortunately there were negative interactions between the uh, livelihoods. As uh, we know, the ponds that were created by opening mangroves, forests were causing damage to the ecosystems, reducing the aquaculture productivity and increasing greenhouse gases uh, emission. In addition, the expansion of aquaculture into the mangroves possibly uh, reduced the population of wild fish and shrimp that make fisher difficult to capture wild shrimp and crabs. Of course, there were many positive interactions to aquaculture. Uh, for example, despite its low productivity, is providing income uh, for the community. Therefore, we are working to improve the situation by restoring uh, the mangroves. Furthermore, aquaculture and also capture uh, fishery were supporting tourism activities by providing fresh fish for uh, tourist consumption. Aquaculture in the Rawan MPA is uh, also unique because uh, women have major role in it, uh, especially in uh, force harvest handling and uh, financial uh, aspect. Uh, thank you. Uh, back to you, Bang Ilman. Thank you, Basir. Yeah. Uh, from our study, it is also interesting to see how COVID-19 impact the community in the Rawan Islands. So currently, there is no tourists, actually since the pandemic started. And at the same time, the price of seafood is dropped uh, drastically. So community can no longer outside doing uh, a fishing activity because it's not efficient anymore. And with less community out for fishing, um, outside fishers came into this area to fill the gap. And they unfortunately using destructive fishing methods such as using bomb. So clearly there is a need for the MPA management team to improve the surveillance and empower local communities so they can do a better livelihood. And also, uh, it's very important to provide a clear status of the land ownership, especially for the shrimp pond. The, the Rawan Island MPA can serve as a test area for innovative solutions applied to this uh, social ecological system. That's all our presentation today. 
um, we hope it will provide information uh, 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 about our works in the Darawan MPA. In this opportunity, we would like to say thank you for uh, our partners implementing this program on the ground, especially uh, the Barao Regency governments and also the East Kalimantan province governments uh, in Indonesia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ilman. I'm, maybe you can hear me. I'm not sure, but <laughs> excellent. Thank you so much for this presentation. And uh, we go to the last one uh, uh, in, in French Polynesia by uh, Simon. Uh, it's uh, also a video. Simon is not online due to the time difference. Ah, on, only sound. We don't have images here. No the video case study sound. of the marine regulated fishing area of Reao Atoll, French Polynesia. This work is the result of hard work of many people, notably Georges Remoisnet and his colleagues from the French Polynesia Fisheries Service, Colette Wabnitz from the University of British Columbia, and many stakeholders and actors from Reao. Reao is the easternmost atoll of the Tuamotu Archipelago, southeast of Tahiti. It is home to nearly 600 inhabitants. Since 2016, the entire atoll is recognized as an MPA, equivalent to EUCN Category 6. In practice, this means that resource use is permitted in line with specific conservation considerations. A notable feature of the MPA is the presence of a large population of the giant clam Tridacna maxima, which is exploited through fishing and mariculture. Giant clams are listed on Appendix 2 of the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of the Fauna and Flora. Giant clam mariculture infrastructure consists of intensive spat collection rafts and spat collected gen clams are sold to Tahitian wholesalers who export them to Europe and the USA for the aquarium trade. Aquaculture professionals can also harvest wild gen clams and export them for the aquarium trade. The MPA regulates fishing and mariculture activities through various measures, including total allowable coaches, no tech areas, and size limit for coach. Monitoring of wild giant clam stock have been performed by aquaculture professionals and the policy chief under advices of local scientists and the fishery services. This monitoring is important to provide evidences to CITES that the wild stock is not endangered, which then allow exporters and importers getting authorizations to transport giant clams. This case study highlighted positive interactions between mariculture and other components of the socio-ecosystem, as aquaculture professionals are required to contribute a portion of their cultured clams to restocking clams in the no tech areas and the involvement of, of a variety of factors and stakeholders in resource management and conservation that resulted from CITES requirements. Thus, it is interesting to note that in this rare case study, it is the giant clam mariculture activity which led to the implementation of an MPA in part to align with CITES requirements. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, Simon is not online, so <laughs> anyway. But uh, it was good to have those uh, four case studies. Before giving the floor to Rafaela, I would like to say that uh, we are now looking at uh, having other case studies. We are uh, having a lot of ideas. Uh, we are looking for uh, demonstration, demonstration case. So if any of you have any idea, that's, uh, we are very, very welcome. We also have some cases, uh, we're looking at some cases in, in Europe, not only in developing countries. Uh, we are looking at doing something with flat oysters in uh, Scotland or with a uh, culture in, in uh, Los Esteros uh, in, in Spain, for example or in Brittany about oysters and, and, and mussels. Uh, our case now are all in developing countries, but it's also interesting to see 
how developed countries, I mean, European countries, or even uh, US can also uh, deal with this idea of uh, marine conservation and, uh, and, um, and aquaculture. And then I can give the floor now to, uh, to Rafaela for a nature-based solution. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, Francois. Um, Okay. I'm okay. Qu'est-ce qui se passe? Non, non, c'est à moi. Sorry, some technical problem. <laughs> yes, here we go. So, um, Here we go. Pardon. Sorry, so we lost the contact for the uh, the, the computer. No. Ah, here we go. Diaporama. Diapositive actually. Here we go. Okay, so uh, be, be, be beyond these uh, study cases, where we s case studies, we also are, have been exploring the concept of nature-based solution as applied to aquaculture systems. And look, we, we have looked at the different criteria. I worked with the, um, the IUCN team and in uh, Switzerland to, with using the, the self-evaluation tool that they are testing. Uh, and we, uh, we looked at all the different facets of this uh, potential application of the global standard to aquacultural system. So you know the NBS global standard, you, we have eight criteria and you can find lots of information about in this um, IUCN Congress. So I don't want to get into details for that, but just to give you an example of some of the questions we may raise with aquaculture. Because aquaculture is a production for food, for different things, just it could be assimilated to agroecological systems in some cases. So why not consider aquaculture as a nature-based solution in some cases? But for in the criterion one, you know, what solution, what targets are we aiming at with aquaculture solution? Um, you know, most of the time we will design aquaculture system to provide food. And uh, perhaps we should go farther on. And uh, this uh, criterion is listing you know, different soci societal challenges. And well, it may be questionable in some cases for aquaculture system how they are responding to, to those challenges. If I take one example, which is the environmental issues for aquaculture systems, we know that some of them have been quite impacting social and envi environmental um, um, ecosystems, marine ecosystems. So that's a key question, which is raised by the criterion one and two and three and all the, the others. <coughs> and the criterion two of the global standards say, you know, you should work at one scale, but in the possibility of upscaling things. And uh, we made the, the, the link between all the work we've been doing in aquaculture related to ecosystem uh, approach for aquaculture. So we have to, to deal with the, the farm scale, but you have to deal with the, the water basin scale and the, the bay and then the land or the, the extra, extra. So the link with the ecosystem approach for aquaculture is quite clear. And another example is the criterion three you know, it states clearly that the, the, the nature-based solutions should provide a benefit for uh, the ecosystem integrity and the biodiversity, again, uh, net gain. So in some, and perhaps many aquaculture systems, this is going to be quite a challenging question. And the work we've been ru running with all these other cases that you've seen, uh, and we hope to, to run some others, it means that we have uh, to dig out innovative approaches, such as perhaps looking at synergies and, you know, some, for instance, wide fauna coming close to the, to the cages. But is it positive or is it negative? This has to be assessed. So we linked 
the assessment of the criterion three, for instance, so global st standard, we linked it to the the the, the value the evaluation of the ecosystem services linked to aquaculture. So really, we have to rely on this aspect as well. And as an example, we used Abud, you know, uh, perhaps he's online. We used the uh, Zanzibar data, and uh, I worked out this self-evaluation tool. And I came out with this kind of results. So it's only a desk study, and it needs that now to be shared with the people in Zanzibar and perhaps be taken as a roadmap. But it clearly shows that even uh, in the case of seaweed farming, which is a low input aquacultural system, some uh, criteria would need to be better informed, such as biodiversity, yes, and also some others like you know the balanced trade-offs and the, the good governance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it shows some of the interest of this potential uh, standard applied to aquacultural systems, and perhaps we need to further dig out new cases to uh, get some interesting conclusions. So now I leave um, the the words to um, Heidi. She's online. She's in in, in Australia. So thanks a lot, Heidi. And I will present you a presentation that you, you made for us, and which is a, a great presentation of your work on restorative aquaculture. So let me launch this. It's growing up. Uh, sorry, sorry. Here we go. There's growing awareness that certain types of fish and fish products can be a There's growing awareness that certain types of fish and Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Heidi Alloway. I'm the Sorry. Global Culture Scientist at the Nature Conservancy. The Nature Conservancy is a science-based environmental organisation, and our mission is to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends. One of our primary priorities to achieve this mission is to ensure the sustainable provision of food and water. There's growing awareness that certain types of fish and fish products can be a sustainable source of food, a valuable source of protein of high nutritional value. But if done well, if practiced with good attention to avoiding environmental impacts, a range of fish and shellfish can be produced by aquaculture using just a fraction of the inputs required for the farming of terrestrial sources of protein and with significantly lower emissions. The sustainability of seafood from aquaculture is linked to the way in which it is farmed, but is also linked to the inherent characteristics of the species that are farmed. For example, shellfish, they naturally filter food from the water column, and so they don't require the addition of feed for farming or the use of other resources such as fresh water, which can be heavily impacted by food production. But in addition to a generally lower footprint, we believe that certain approaches to aquaculture could also actively deliver positive ecosystem outcomes. Restorative aquaculture, which can broadly be viewed as an analog of regenerative agriculture, provides an opportunity to simultaneously improve the health of aquatic environments whilst providing food and economic outcomes. Research on ecosystem interactions in aquaculture show us there are genuine environmental benefits that can be provided by aquaculture activities. And again, using the example of shellfish, because they do naturally filter water, a single hectare of shellfish farm can turn over up to 25 million gallons of water per day removing more than half a tonne of nitrogen per year. We're also beginning to appreciate that this range of benefits could be quite broad. For example, we recently estimated the habitat formed by aquaculture farms can increase the abundance of fish by up to five tonnes per hectare per year. Also, there is a lot of attention that's being given to seaweed aquaculture as a potential pathway to support climate mitigation because seaweeds are very productive, they grow very fast, and they capture large quantities of carbon dioxide. This is, however, a relatively new and growing area for research. And so just how significant could these environmental benefits be? 
Looking specifically at the potential for aquaculture to provide habitat, we recently completed a global review of literature and an analysis of 65 studies to quantify the relative habitat benefits of mussel, oyster, clam and seaweed farms. In comparison to nearby reference sites, sites without aquaculture, we found increased effects on diversity and abundance across all farming species, though the size of this effect did vary. For example, mussel aquaculture, which typically occurs using long lines hung in the water, was found to have an abundance of fish and mobile macroinvertebrates an average of 3.6 times greater than nearby reference sites. The diversity of species, however, was more strongly enhanced by oyster and seaweed aquaculture, with the effect of that enhancement being an average of 1.3 times in each instance. I've provided here the link to the reference for this study, as well as a summary article of our results. So as well as undertaking this synthesis research for farm scale benefits, we've also examined environmental, socioeconomic and human health conditions most associated with restorative aquaculture outcomes at a global scale. We found that nearly all continents and most coastal countries have the potential to benefit from this practice in marine environments through other shellfish or seaweed farming. And again, I've provided a link to this study, as well as a link to a map that provides the opportunity to explore the results of the analysis and the country scale data. Throughout 2021, we've been supporting a global working group to share understanding of restorative aquaculture. This group has prepared a white paper that will be published in October. The white paper contains a definition and a set of global principles surrounding the concept. It also contains guidance for industry, government and community on aquaculture practices that can best enable environmental benefits to be provided. But now, I have a question for you. Does the idea that aquaculture can provide environmental benefits make sense? Have you experienced this? Or have you heard farmers talk about the health of seagrass under their leases, the amount of fish and wildlife that can occur around their farm, the fact that water can seem clearer in their area? This is a question we all need to reflect on and continually work to understand because it could be one way, an important way, for us to work toward a future that helps people as well as nature. Well, thanks, thanks a lot, Heidi. Uh, and she, is Heidi online? So, who is online? I, Heidi, uh, Ilman, Heidi, Bashir, also, and uh, on. <laughs> okay, Abud is not online. No, okay. Well, thank you very much, all anyway, for this uh, very interesting. And, and Hussam is also here. Uh, okay, so I think you you have an overview of what we have been or we are trying to do is to, to link really aquaculture uh, and, and, and marine conservation and to look at really the positive side of it because during many years um, people have been saying that aquaculture has been negative impact which is true by the way but uh, our purpose is to look at positive impact and there are good interactions there are positive interaction and this group this IBAG ecosystem based aquaculture group is really trying to put together experts that uh, want to go in this direction and uh, well so we have here a number of experts in the room. I see uh, Ricardo is also with us from, from the beginning here uh, in our eBag, or, or David, also a member of this eBag group. Or, and uh, we have the, our experts online. So, uh, well, we have uh, some time for a, a debate. Uh, thanks also to you. We have a good question for beginning. Um, uh, we have all together 20 minutes because at, uh, at uh, four fifteen sharp, we have to close this event. And before that, I will give the floor to uh, to uh, also our good uh, uh, sponsor, not sponsor. <laughs> well, uh, you, you could see it's not uh, on the screen now, uh, a, a very strange logo on, on the screen, which is kind of a star. And this is a logo of the, of the French, uh, France IUCN partnership. And all of this work has been funded by this partnership. And so I uh, will give the floor to Catherine to tell us something about it. Uh, anyway, uh, so up to, to you to have comments, questions, uh, whatever. You want to reactions, uh, ideas, uh, question to our uh, colleagues. Uh, you have the floor. I don't know. Yes, please. Uh, is there a microphone somewhere? Uh, excellent. Thank you. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm Cecile Astier, working at bluegreen.earth. My question is how to engage 
big uh, company producing shrimps or fish or whatever in more sustainable or even sustainable <laughs> uh, production. Okay, well, good, good question. I don't know who and the panel wants to, uh, to try to answer this one. How to engage the, uh, the, com the aquaculture comp companies in the sustainability issues? Or anyone in the room maybe wants to answer that? Hussam, yes, please. Uh, maybe I could tell. Uh, Oh, sorry, uh, Ilman, Ilman or Hussam? Oh, uh, Ilman, uh, Ilman, Ilman, please. Yeah, there are, yeah, a good, quick answer. Uh, we, industry has actually a kind of standard. Yeah, usually we kind of, uh, 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 kind of stewardship uh, a standard uh, on how to uh, make the producer uh, and all the supply chains uh, meet this standard to make sure that the uh, the production system and supply chains uh, will not harm the environment. So basically, if the producer and uh, industry and consumer uh, can sit together and uh, agree on the standard, that's one uh, way to engage uh, industry on improving the aquaculture to make sure it's uh, not harm the environment. Okay, thank you, Ilman. Uh, Hussam? Thank you, Francois. For the GFCM, the answer is quite simple. How to, uh, if we want really to engage a private sector, we explain to them that we have a, a healthy environment, a stronger aquaculture industry will be. So we are in a market driven aquaculture. Consumer can also ask for standards. Uh, countries also have to answer to, 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 uh, to these standards. And what we will do in the GFCM is to work and supporting country to adopt resolution recommendation that they can apply in their countries and uh, pushing private sector, encouraging private sector to follow. The sustainability is not only a matter of uh, production, it's also a matter of consumption and, and uh, you know, consumer have a good, uh, an important role to play. Thank you, Hussam. I uh, would also like to say that, uh, yeah, I give the floor, but I'd like to say that uh, we are also working with uh, the Aquaculture Stewardship Council, IIC, and uh, which is, we set up standards. I know we are embarked with them in uh, looking at the relationship between marine protected areas and aquaculture. And hopefully in some, some time, we'll have also standards uh, which link aquaculture uh, and MPA by, by IIC. Yes, please. Hello, my name is uh, Thies Gerz from the Global Nature Fund. We are a Germany-based uh, NGO for nature and the environment. And we are presently implementing a project on integrated mangrove aquaculture in Bangladesh and India. So I follow your presentations with uh, big interest. And I, I would like to emphasize, I mean, it's not a question, it's more, more comment, comment that goes into the same direction. Um, the, the main challenge for us is to make for the farmers a model that is economically viable because ultimately the product the farmer is producing, the shrimp, it's one part is for the local market and the other one, other part is for the export to Asia, the United States and Europe. And the problem is that the consumer right now is not willing to pay a higher price for a product that takes into account the environment. So our farmers are directly competing with the farmers that disrespect, you know, the mangrove forest and the environment, but they produce for a more competitive price. So we are really struggling. I think the farmers are willing to adopt. The farmers are, have a big will to adopt because they can see the benefits of the mangrove trees in their aquaculture ponds. But they say, however, we have to compete with our neighbors and please help us to find some markets that are willing to pay additional price for our product. And I don't know what, what your opinion is or what your solution is. Obviously not easy, but I would be interested in, in your views. Thank you. I think this question Thank is for Ilman. <laughs> yes, please, Ilman. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we have, we faced we shared a similar challenge. Yeah, um, our farmers doing a good thing, but the product is not um, uh, uh, well 
uh, I mean, uh, not really pay, uh, yeah, based on the effort that our farmers uh, do. So it is very important uh, for the consumer to also uh, share, uh, to be, uh, yeah, share their um, contributions to help uh, for better environments. Because at the end of the day, we, we have one earth. Yeah, we all will suffer uh, if we're the consumer uh, are not able to make their contribution to help the farmer uh, improve uh, the their way they produce uh, the stream and other aquaculture or seafood products. There are other ways that we currently doing in our project site in Indonesia is by uh, helping uh, the, the farmer to restore the mangrove. Our expectation is that through these mangrove restorations, one day we could include this in forest, uh, uh, sorry, in carbon uh, carbon financing uh, uh, mechanism. So there will be additional income we expect that uh, coming from the carbon price uh, that uh, done through um, uh, uh, mangrove restoration uh, within the stream pond that we are now working with uh, the community in Indonesia. So uh, that's that's uh, one thing, but it's, it will be very important uh, that uh, the burden for improving the environment uh, with the uh, uh, producer, yeah, especially smallholder farmers, is not only uh, uh, become uh, the burden for the farmer uh, as a producer, but we should share this, yeah, through uh, uh, throughout the uh, the supply chains, particularly the consumer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ilman. Uh, David or. Well, yeah, please, please go ahead, go ahead. Um, hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Liz Day. I work for Malia Sili. I've been um, living and working in Madagascar for uh, quite some time, supporting local associations in conservation work and also um, in marine conservation. Um, and I worked over a number of years with an aquaculture project, which was within an MPA there, focusing on seaweed. <laughs> Um, now, there are undoubtedly a catalogue of reasons why seaweed is a very good thing, mostly for um, communities living in chronic poverty because it grows very quickly, it's dried, so we don't have the problematic of getting very fresh seafood onto a project quickly. So it has enormous amounts of benefits. Yet, I would like to know if anyone here has had um, or has solutions to the type of collateral damage that can come on the environment when one provides pretty substantial economic benefits to a community rather quickly. Um, so notably the destruction of mangrove close by to rapidly build more houses um, or to buy um, much more performing fishing gears to therefore, um, you know, um, fish more. <laughs> And, um, and yeah, and I would be really interested in knowing if anyone has experience in perhaps making exchanges um, um, of providing alternative livelihoods, for instance, with um, implementing no take zones or conservation contracts or any, any such a sort of governance mechanism which could um, help reduce that kind of um, collateral damage. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you for this question. Maybe somebody want to. Answer to one to answer, uh, Rafaela or? Yes, um, this is a this is a quite a difficult question, and I guess uh, what we are trying to push t towards is the fact that uh, the agricultural system is within another system, and you know you have to develop a, a, a good governance system um, uh, on the on the the zone where you are working. In, and so that you can have some equitable uh, trade-offs decided and, and so on, the choice of the communities. And this is quite challenging because uh, it also depends very much from local authorities and the way it is organized. And uh, um, uh, Inman talked about land properties, so you know some of the regulations may cause some problems too. So there is no answer, but probably the way to go is to push towards integrated coastal zone management where you have aquaculture and marine protected area which allows different activities may be a way also of having this sort of a coastal management because they, you can define zones within the, the marine protected area where you have no take, where you have aquaculture like uh, uh, Usam was talking about marine spatial planning that they did and it was a good tool that they could apply 
Thank you, Rafael and David. And yeah, thank you, D David de Montbrison from uh, Consulting Office, BRL Engineering. Uh, uh, first, thank you very much for all this presentation and, we and well done. It was really interesting. I have uh, comments and questions, especially I was interested in the, I feel that the demonstration of the, the inputs, uh, positive inputs you made uh, uh, by studying uh, various uh, areas with uh, uh, seaweeds and uh, clams and shellfish was very interesting. The world uh, study you, you did and it should be more uh, work on this to demonstrate the, the positive effect on biodiversity. Uh, but uh, did you do some work on, on fish uh, production? Uh, the loss and the gain in terms of biodiversity uh, study. And also uh, another comment is on uh, IMTA uh, the, and constraints. For the moment, IMTA is developed uh, legally in, in Canada, but with very poor uh, operative practice uh, by the private sector. And indeed, the private sector has a capacity to develop uh, uh, research and improvement in terms of production. It needs to be economically effective, but the big industry uh, could be uh, maybe uh, 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 pushed to by a legal uh, framework and, and control to have part of their production, even experimental, developed in terms of IMTA. Uh, and this could be a, a, an answer for demonstration of the f future of aquaculture. So my last question is, uh, did you do a study on, on fish uh, biodiversity? So I'm calling the, the Australian uh, <laughs> colleague. And also on IMTA, are you following the, the works in order to demonstrate also the, the impact on biodiversity of uh, co-production uh, on coastal zones? Thank, thank you very much, David. So, ID, please, you have the floor. Yes, no problems. Um, so the first question um, for the results that I showed today, um, we have built on that initial database and that an initial evaluation that was a review and collation and then meta-analysis of, um, of uh, existing data associated with macroinvertebrates. We have extended that into um, data to look at fish abundance as well. We haven't yet finalised the results of that, but we are seeing similar trends. Um, we are seeing some enhancement in fish populations as well. But you did also make a comment early on, I think, um, that is very valuable that we need to continue exploring this. And what we do know is that local effects and the local context of aquaculture um, is uh, it does have a very um, significant effect on the benefits that can be provided. And so we would love to see more research on the ground in multiple geographies. And I think across um, you know different zones, tropical uh, temperate areas, just so that we can really add a lot of knowledge um, to this particular um, uh, interaction, I think, uh, and start to answer the questions in much more detail. As for IMTA, um, we are very interested and very aware um, of the IMTA model. I think there are some significant challenges that still, you know, as you said, uh, need to be overcome with this particular model. And so what we are considering um, is, I think, an approach that is more reflective of polyculture. And so trying to understand how combining um, several species, two species, three species or more, might actually provide um, enhanced benefits across those. We do think that there's an economic value to doing that. And we also think that there's an environmental value. So for co-culture and polyculture, uh, that's probably where our focus sits at the moment, um, more so than actually um, engaging further in IMTA research, which we know is um, ongoing in, in many places. I hope that, that answers that well enough for you. Thanks, thanks a lot, Adi. And really, thank, thanks a lot for being here with us. Uh, uh, since you, it's, uh, What time is it in, in Australia? Three o'clock or something like that? Uh, it's, it's just past midnight. Yeah, close yeah, to 1 a.m. Well, it's time for <laughs> Inman, by the way. So it's really, thank you so much. Uh, we are t getting, uh, uh, yeah, now it's uh, only four minutes left. So I think we are, want to wrap up. All those case studies, are, there are reports. Reports are online on the IUCN website, so you can uh, download that at, at the moment for reports. We are looking for other uh, case studies, especially on IMTA. If we can get a good case study on this, it will be really great. And uh, in order to close this session, I give the floor to uh, 
to uh, Catherine from IFD, and she will uh, explain why she's here. <laughs> Thank you, Francois. And as has been said several times already, uh, I'm here because this project was funded uh, by the France IUCN Partnership and implemented by, by AFD. And it's been really great to work with, with the IUCN team and follow the, the activity step by step. Um, at AFD, we're really keen to fund more on aquaculture. At the moment, we have a few projects, but not that much on marine aquaculture. And uh, we're keen to fund these projects, especially if they are linked to conservation activities and MPAs and taking into account an ecosystem-based approach to, to, to aquaculture. Um, the countries of the case studies are of great interest for, for AFD. In Tunisia, we have a project and one of the activity is to develop uh, an aquaculture development plan, taking into account all the environmental aspects as well. In Indonesia, we have a vast portfolio of ocean, ocean projects. We've also worked with Polynesia in the past, uh, looking at uh, aquaculture development matrices and things like this. We're not working yet in Tanzania, but actually this project may have just have uh, laid and made the first step um, to, for, to allow us to, to work in, in Tanzania. And that's exactly what we need from this type of project and this type of studies is to understand the issues, what is at stake, and support the dialogue with our local counterparts and help us also identify projects that, that IFD can afterwards um, fund. So really this, this type of activity is key for us and as hope it's also um, useful to all of you participants. I would like to thank all the speakers and also the participants for their question and their engagement. And I really look forward to working with the IUCN team again on, on aquaculture and the great work that have, we have been doing on the Aquacoco project. Thank you very much.